Mexico City has come to a standstill because of the High deadly fever, body aches, cough, runny nose. If you have those symptoms for 24 to 48 hours and you are getting worse, yesterday the state announced the eighth H1N1 death here. The influenza porcina. It put the world on alert as it swept across the globe in a matter of weeks, infecting millions, killing thousands. The H1N1 flu, a relentless virus including both human and animal genes, was first detected here in San Diego, California, when on April 14, 2009, a sick boy's lab test came back with a disturbing result. It was determined that this was indeed an influenza virus that had not been previously detected. A mysterious virus that carried a swine protein. Strange to think, but people do, on occasion, catch flu viruses from animals. So this one boy with a unique swine virus was seen as being more of a concern than a crisis. But that all changed a few days later, when a second child came down with the same strain of swine flu. We were pretty convinced that we had a situation where we had a novel virus uh, for which there was a human to human transmission, uh, and that really made us very alarmed. Messages flew between the county health office in San Diego, the Federal Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, and the California Department of Public Health in Sacramento. We were alerted both at the state level and, and at the national level that we were that we were on the brink of a of a major uh, problem here. Scientists at the San Diego Public Health Laboratory immediately ramped up surveillance. So on Monday morning, the 19th, we called all the hospitals. We said, send us everything that you have that's a recent flu A isolate. And on Tuesday, we tested, oh, about 16 specimens. It was unbelievable because I was new. I was on a telephone conference with the CDC at the time. And as the results came in at 515, and it was like there were four specimens that were unsubtypable. That meant that they weren't H1, they weren't H3, they weren't avian influenza, they were like, we didn't know what. Dr. Janice Louie, epidemiologist with the State Department of Public Health, was also on that call with the CDC. I thought we had a full-blown severe pandemic. It was gonna potentially kill young, healthy adults. That was the same picture we heard about with 1918 previously healthy young adults dying, and I was very worried that that was going to happen here. The 1918 pandemic hit at the close of World War I, possibly spread by returning troops. Grotesque and ugly in their influenza masks, the people of San Francisco celebrate. 20 to 50 million people died, 500,000 in the U.S. alone. And it was a very real possibility this new flu virus in San Diego could be just as deadly. When we initially worked with this thing, we would wear head covering with what's called a papper with a special airflow. So we had purified air only that we were breathing in case if we were to drop something on the floor that this wasn't you know, gonna kill the staff. So we didn't know what we had, but we were really scared and worried. There was cause for worry. The virus contained a rare combination of genes. It had H1 swine virus genes, which were originally introduced in 1918. It also had some genes that come from what's known as the Asian swine that had never been seen in North or South America before. Then there's avian, that means that something was transferred from a bird to a swine. Then it had at least one or two genes that came from a human virus origin, but it was a combination of genes that had never been seen before. We were concerned, you know, that, that it was, uh, uh, looked quite sophisticated and quite uh, different than anything we've seen in the past. We were looking at, in many cases, worst case scenarios. What are the resources we would have had to mobilize if in fact we had something as severe and such as extensive as 1918? As everyone knows, the situation is ongoing. On Tuesday, the 21st of April, the San Diego County Health Department went public. If individuals are sick with mild symptoms, we want them to stay home. For Dr. McVeigh, the days following that announcement were a blur, as her staff went from testing dozens of specimens to thousands. We had basketfuls. We had basketfuls all over the place, piles of them. Blood specimens were jammed in every available refrigerator and freezer. I mean, this is just 
packed with them. We ended up color coding everything. A makeshift priority system was developed using a child's coloring set. Dr. Wooten's office was overburdened as well as they compiled the incoming data. We collect information on pen and paper and not necessarily in an electronic system where you can just push a button and get um, reports. Creating an obvious log jam until one of Wooten's colleagues suggested they simply download some data collaboration software. The closest thing to a tracking system that we could come up with was the utilization of SharePoint. And it really did make a significant difference in the way we manage our cases. Even the California State Lab in Richmond, with all its resources and staff, was bending under the burden of managing and identifying thousands of specimens. We brought the whole lab into this because it was really overwhelming. It was unique, truly unique. In the back of everyone's mind was the mysterious and deadly virus that had been spreading across Mexico since the beginning of the year. Eventually, you know, we made a determination that the California cases share the same strain as the Mexico cases. That became very alarming because clearly the potential for a pandemic was very real. At Scripps Mercy Hospital in San Diego, infectious disease specialist Dr. Gonzalo Bayanlanta started to see cases build up in the ICU. I treated many patients who had H1N1. Most of the patients that I treated with H1N1 were here in the hospital and they were very severely ill. It was beginning to look like it was a lot like the 1918 flu. And of course we knew if, if that was the case, there would be residual immunity in our older population, but none in the younger population. That's why we were seeing primarily the attacks were on the, on the young. At that point we knew that it was not possible to uh, contain the virus, but we had to mitigate and decrease the spread of the virus because the, the horse was really out of the barn at that point. But health officials were braced for the stampede. For years they had been preparing for an outbreak. We had been planning since 2006 for some sort of pandemic flu problem. School districts were integral to the plan because children could be the first to get sick in large numbers. One of the things that we had set up was a reporting structure that the school sites could report their um, attendance and what kids were out with. And sure enough, on the 28th of April, a principal at this elementary school in Contra Costa County noticed a sudden spike in sick children. They had a cluster of students who came down ill, who had ties with Mexico. The county health department was called. They came out and they did some testing on some of those students. And um, this was on Tuesday. And by Tuesday night, they had made the decision they were going to close that school. Well, Highlands Elementary will be closed for a week. A big decision to make. It was the first H1N1 school closure, disrupting the lives of hundreds of families. Not acting isn't an option. Dr. Wendell Bruner, public health director for Contra Costa County, is the one who ordered the school closures. You can't just sit and wait for um, events to unfold and to find out exactly what you should have done six months ago. The public, appropriately, wouldn't tolerate that. So you need to make the best guesses you can make based on the best scientific evidence you can muster and you need to do it in real time. Three days later, on the 1st of May, San Diego County Health Office ordered the closure of three high schools. I remember the day vividly because it was a huge decision. It was just a big deal, and the impact of closing a school and the impact that that will have uh, on the teachers, on the parents, uh, it was huge. But that weekend, researchers at the CDC announced the H1N1 virus wasn't as virulent as first feared. By Monday, they relaxed their school closure guidelines, saying schools with infected children could now remain open. More than a dozen Bay Area schools closed because of concerns about the spread of swine flu are set to reopen tomorrow. That's because federal health officials have changed policy. We had to make decisions like closing schools, not closing schools, a whole variety of decisions based on incomplete information. And we had to make tentative decisions, the best that can be done, and then explain to the public that these are tentative decisions and we may be coming back tomorrow or next week with a new set of recommendations. A confused public, though, began to wonder what was going on. 
Conspiracy postings on the internet claim the pandemic was either a plot by the government to frighten the public into passing health care reform, or a creation by greedy corporations to market medications. The reality? Health officials still didn't know what they had on their hands. In public health, we're based on science. But by the time we have the scientific evidence to absolutely show what we should be doing, we should have already have done it. By late spring, as schools let out for the summer, the number of cases subsided. The press and the public, thinking the scare over, stopped paying attention. But health officials could see the H1N1 outbreak was unfolding like a textbook pandemic with natural ebbs and flows. And without a vaccine, the virus was certain to make a comeback. To prepare for the anticipated second wave, epidemiologists desperately needed to find out who was dying from the virus. I began to really look intensively at the fatal cases that were coming in. And it was notable that they weren't elderly, as is typical in a seasonal influenza. What was so alarming about the H1N1 virus is that the fatality rate was opposite of the seasonal flu. The vast majority of people H1N1 killed, 90%, were under the age of 65. We had uh, very few cases uh, and very few hospitalizations among the elderly, so that was actually very puzzling and very worrisome to us that we had um, a new virus for which uh, the population had no immunity uh, that was largely impacting young, healthy people, and that was uh, very scary. One, two, three. Another at-risk group, expectant mothers. Very heartbreaking stories of going into premature labor um, being in an ICU, being otherwise healthy, and just coming in very sick and having to be intubated while they're in the emergency room. 